In today's linear economy, natural resources are extracted to create products, and products are disposed when they're no longer useful. Such model is costly, not only in terms of economic value, it also imposes great loss to the environment. In recent years, the circular economy has gained increasing prominence as a solution to some of the world's most pressing cross-cutting sustainable development challenges. The reuse, repair, reproduce model provides much promise to accelerate implementation of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. It is well established, geospatial and Earth observation data are powerful tools in measuring, monitoring and reporting of the SDGs. For circular economy, supply chain transparency and traceability, waste reduction, product lifetime extension, recycling campaigns and maximizing the use of underused assets, will be key to a successful transition. Geospatial and location data, are the underpinning of these practices. In the next two days, industry experts, policymakers and innovators will share ideas, and explore the opportunities further. Welcome to the Symposium on SDG and Circular Economy. Yes, uh, welcome, and I'm Ulla, I'm the moderator. It's a privilege, really, to, to be moderating this session. Welcome also to all the virtual attendancies, and uh, I will urge you all, here in the hall, and virtually to pose a lot of questions so we can have engaging sessions. But without more ado, I will introduce the first speaker, our keynote speaker, Mr. Greg Scott. So would you please take the podium? The floor is yours. And welcome, everyone. Um, the other thing, too, was, was it was great to actually see that video because the, the, topic, the topic here of, of this talk, very brief, but the topic for today is actually, there's a lot in it. So when we think about the, the theme of, of, this, of this GWF around geospatial infrastructure, um, digital twin, SDGs, circular economy, the future agenda of geospatial, the future agenda of statistics, and how they fit into the SDGs. This is a really complex topic um, against a complex topic against a complex topic. So what I wanted to do as the start for today was just give a bit of an overview to some of those complexities um, and let all of the experts talk a lot more about this over the day. So with that, um, starting with the SDGs. Now, we all know what the SDGs are. We heard a lot about the SDGs yesterday, um, but I guess what I wanted to, I guess, reiterate or strengthen is that the SDGs are really the peak of a number of global development agendas. So between 2014 and 2017, within the UN system around the world, major global development agendas were adopted by all countries. And the pinnacle of that was the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the 17 SDGs. But really important is those underpinning agendas. And we're seeing now, as been mentioned yesterday, we have, for example, COP26 coming up, which is tied to the Paris Agreement. So these are really important, and intrinsically, all of those other agendas, such as the Sendai Framework, the Urban Agenda, the Oceans Agenda, are all tied into the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. Also of note is the fact that in the 2030 Agenda, and hardwired in that agenda and a number of others, is the need for geospatial information Earth observations, new sources of data, innovative data, um, and data that is not typical when we think about, particularly in the Millennium Development Goals, how we measure and monitor. So a lot more requirement for data. And in that, it was really about saying, okay, where are our problems? Where are our challenges? Where do we intervene? And how do we do that? And that's really where the idea of location and geography became really important in supporting particularly the statistical process of reporting into the SDGs. So being able to measure where and what's happening, when, became really, really important. And then there's the other element about global to local. We have global agendas, but what's really important is local implementation. And I think that's really difficult as we think about how we report on the SDGs how does that fit at a community level? Um, 
and that becomes even more difficult. And I'll touch on a little bit of that as we go into, into this very brief introduction. The other thing was, what is the circular economy? Um, and we just saw a bit of a video on that, and that helped because I'm not so sure we all understand what a circular economy is and how that applies, particularly when we think about development. Um, and so, as has just been explained, it's really about taking that very linear approach to the economy on how we, we extract, use, and, and dispose is really how we use that um, into a more circular approach where we use different areas and links around extraction, use, reuse, recycle, etc. cetera. Um, and, and that's really about our resources. And so when we think about our resources, how does that then apply to development? And I'll come back to that in just a moment. So this circular economy, okay, it's circular, got it. But what does that really mean? And, and I'm, I'm using a couple of slides here that actually um, have been generated by PBL in Netherlands. So hey, you know, when in Rome, do as Romans do, as they say. So, so one, of the, one of the key elements of the circular economy is that the European Union has really taken it on quite seriously on how we, we take that approach. And countries like the Netherlands in particular have said, okay, what does that mean and how do we do that? So there's been some great work in the Netherlands and other European countries as how we approach the circular economy. And you can see the different examples of that there. Um, we do a lot of work, obviously, in the UN around, around energy. And so, for example, at the moment, right now in Beijing and China is the Global Transport Conference. We've got COP26 coming up. We're going to be talking about climate. We're going to be talking about energy and these sort of aspects. But I guess it's then how the, our, our natural resources or our natural ecosystems or our environmental ecosystems fit into that production cycle and how we then use that and, and reuse over, over time and over life cycles. And the, and the hard part of, about this is then saying, okay, how does that apply to the SDGs? And this is where I guess it gets really difficult because we can all say, yep, we're supporting the SDGs. Okay, so what are you doing? Oh, well, we're supporting goal two. We're ending hunger, etc. We're looking at consumption in goal 12 and how we actually reduce that. But when you actually get down to some of the tangibles, when you think about, um, say, for example, the, the indicators that countries measure against, it becomes a lot more complex. So, so this is not an easy, an easy out. And I guess when we bring that into the environment of our community, it becomes a little bit more complex. So, sticking with the theme of sustainable development and the SDGs and the circular economy, we in the UN, you, basically there's a number of goals that tie into this idea of the circular economy. But the one that's really, I guess, hardwired is, is goal 12 on res responsible consumption and production. And I'm just using a little infographic here that we've been using that's, that's on our website just to give some key messages around consumption um, and production. And each year as we report on the sustainable development goals and the SDG report, you get all the different metrics about what that means and how countries are addressing that. So, so the message is that SDG 12 is really about how we produce, how we consume, and now the discussion around that circular economy. But in saying that, almost every goal under the 17 SDGs has a role to play in that circular economy, um, particularly when we think about the developing world. Um, and I'd like to touch a little bit on that um, just now. So, coming to the next point is about geospatial and statistical organisations or the community, our community, what's that future agenda and how does that tie into the SDGs, how does that tie into the circular economy. So here we have, um, I guess, what's been conceived by, by UNGGIM, the UN Committee of Experts on Global Geospatial Information Management, over the last five or six years is really, I guess, that contribution 
that contributes to the SDGs, but also a number of thematic areas, including the statistical world. And I won't go into this in too much detail, but I guess what's really important is that there's a bit of a daisy chain effect here. So when we think about a number of these global sort of frameworks or outcomes along the bottom, where you can see six different areas of thematic interest there, we're kind of familiar with the idea as we daisy chain up such as things around geodesy, you know, positioning, knowing where we are positioned and being able to measure from our position. And that starts with the positioning of the earth itself, right down to local datums and where we are and, and where we're actually framing our world in terms of location. And then our global fundamental data themes are another mechanism which includes geodesy into saying this, these are the data themes that frame the SDGs and our other global agendas. And then that starts getting from, I guess, practical data or practical components of an infrastructure to then the frameworks that help support that. And we've developed a number of those. Um, a strategic framework that, that responds to the Sendai framework with regard to disasters. Another framework on effective land administration that really looks at the land element, um, particularly when we think about land, land ownership, rights, responsibilities, um, particularly in the developing world. And then our global statistical geospatial framework. So that framework is a connection between the statistical and the geospatial community and our different, our different, I guess, data architectures. So that becomes a glue, particularly for a lot of those frameworks across the bottom. And overarching all of that is our integrated geospatial information framework, or the IGIF. So we've developed a number of frameworks that connects communities, connects different elements of our global geospatial community, but also provides the frameworks, the tools, the methods for us to deal with the addressing of the SDGs. But there's one other in, in terms of, okay, but what does that really mean? I mentioned earlier when we talk about a goal or a target or an indicator, how do we actually connect to the reporting? And so there's been a, a bunch of work that's, that's been undertaken over the last year or so is actually an SDGs geospatial roadmap that's now connecting our geospatial and statistical community directly into the reporting of our 231 global indicators, directly into that indicator framework. So we have this architecture in place to help the future agenda of, of our communities. And one of the key, the key elements of that now is how we go into an implementation mode. And I know a number of you in this room are very familiar with how we're going about doing that within our regional committees and our regional commissions around the world, um, particularly right now as we have a number of those taking place. So that's really sort of where we are in terms of our process into the SDGs. One of the frustrations of that is we're already six years into a, to a 15 year agenda but it's about the framing of the next, the next, I can't even say 10 years of anymore, the next nine years, because we're already into our, our decade of action. Okay, so, quiz time. Um, I want to just come back to the theme of the, of the conference a little bit and say, well, where does this fit in when we say our geospatial infrastructure and our digital twin and the SDGs? So, World population, what is it? 7.9 7 .9 billion. 7.9 billion, really, is it? <laughs> Go to the top of the class. <laughs> Next question. So, of that 7.9 billion, the developing world is so let's take out China. Exactly, it's a maths. It's a maths now, isn't it? But it's getting close. But let's just exclude China because China's really a, a, a unique case. It's kind of like a country in transition. But if you took that out, I'll help you along. So our developing world is 3.6 billion. So if we actually added in China, which we won't, but if we added in China, we're looking at 5 billion out of out of 8 billion people around the world are in the developing world. Do you reckon they know much about digital twins? And so, so here's our challenge. 
And as we develop, we're seeing other development, and we call that population growth, and that's growing really quickly and roughly, as we heard yesterday from that great, great talk around climate, was roughly 80 million, and so 70 million of that is in the developing world annually. So the challenge we have when we think about geospatial infrastructure and the digital twin, our challenge in our communication is how do we, how do we message that? I'm about to head off to a meeting in Africa in a couple of weeks. How do we measure some of this? And so when we think about digital twins, this is, there's, there's a reality here that we have to contest with. And, and whilst we, we, we think about all of these different elements, what, is, what, what does that mean? And how do we translate that into something like that? Um, and, and, and to be honest, some of those photos are my own. Okay, it's not like they're just taken out of a picture book. Um, and in fact, the one on the right-hand side is outside the window of the hotel I stay in, in Ethiopia, right next to um, the Economic Commission for Africa. Amazing. Okay, so, so the question is, is, and I'm struggling, and we heard it yesterday about digital twins, about it being a buzzword. I heard that five times. Oh, the new buzzword. And no, it's not a buzzword, but it, it's like the digital twin is something that's compartmentalized into a particular sector or theme or something. It's not like we're creating a global digital twin, even though that was even Al Gore's idea you know, 20 years ago. So, so the question that we have is what does that really mean and how do we communicate that? What is it? It's, it's a, a digital version or a digital concept of our reality. Um, that's how I see it. It's an abstract of the real world. Maps are abstracts of the real world. Um, but what does that mean? Are they, so they can go from very abstract to very realistic. And then so what are, we, what are we trying to do here? How are we connecting our digital twins to development? How dynamic is that? And how, how do we actually manage that quantum of information? And so as we heard yesterday from Chris Tucker about the metaverse, and the question is, you know, are we a metaverse or are we actually talking about, as we, we had a little discussion with, with Tim and Peter yesterday, a geospatial avatar? What, 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 are, what are we really looking at? So I just thought I'd, I'd pose some of that. Um, so I'm going to leave it at that. But I guess the, the point is that none of this is easy and it's all about a journey. And, and as you'll see from many of the presentations coming up today, it's how we actually move that journey forward. But what's really important is also how we communicate that and what that means so that we, we actually do make progress. Thank you so much. Look forward to the discussion. Thank you. And uh, what I failed to mention before is that uh, Mr. Scott is the Intern Regional Advisor for the UNGGIN. I should have done that, but it's oh, done now. <laughs> we, we have time, even though time is running, uh, Master. Do we have a question uh, for Mr. Scott? Then please. You, you, Yes, you did, but yeah, <laughs> we started a bit late. Are there any uh, from the virtual audience? And while we have the, uh, the virtual question, um, yes, please, do you do have a question, so please. Is it okay using my mic? Yeah. Don't make it too hard. <laughs> I'm curious to learn more about the, the roadmap you talked about. Now, um, is that enhancing the indicator data in terms of like metadata and how to collect the data, or can you talk a little bit more about what it entails? Uh, okay, so, so good, bad, or otherwise, the indicators are what they are, and the metadata are what they are. So they, you know, as we know, they were developed through the 2015-16 period by the Statistical Commission. And a lot of those indicators are heavily reliant on statistical data and, and reporting and comparability. So what, what the, what's been difficult is for the community to say, well, how do we apply the geospatial earth observation and other innovative data sources to that framework without changing that framework? Um, and a number of countries have been doing that of their own accord. Um, and I'll use Sandra from Dane as an example. So the question is that, so the indicator framework is that they're indicators and countries choose how they use that. But what's been, okay, as a message, what's not been well understood and a challenge we've had is that 
GS, statistical data is official data, but geospatial information is not. But it is, because it's the real world. And so what it's trying to do is message and communicate those sorts of aspects and where and how you can actually apply geospatial earth observation and other technology approaches to the framework itself, if that makes sense. Yep. And that SDGs roadmap is going to the Statistical Commission for its next session in March. It's just been through UNGGIM. It's on our website um, and it's an advanced draft. It's actually going through the IAG right now. So uh, please welcome now uh, Menojan Krak, Professor of Geovisual Analytics and Cartography of the University of Twente. And after that, we have Britta Rika, Assistant Professor, Copernicus Institute for Sustainable Development at Utrecht University. So please, the floor is yours. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be here. And it's also a pleasure to be speaking after Greg, because he paved the way for me, because he used all kinds of keywords um, which I can step on, so to say. Uh, he talked about uh, yeah, complexity of, of statistics, of space, of, of all kinds of issues and problems and, and yeah, roadmaps. So I think I would like to link to this because as International Cartographic Association, we have over the years also been thinking, okay, how can we contribute? And in, in that sense, we thought, okay, if this complexity is there and it's about space, statistics, well, we have the solution in our hands. Well, we, we claim. We, we do maps. And these maps should um, yeah, help us to get insight and follow the, the, the progress of all these indicator data to this 2030. We also realized that making maps is not that simple. And therefore we thought, okay, we can probably help the community by, by writing down um, how to make good maps and also how to avoid all kinds of traps. And here is this book, it's, it's a long year project. Greg knows that I've been talking about it for several years and I wonder at the end, let's say last year, if you still believed me that it was coming, but he has touched it this morning, so he now believes. And um, what I would like to do with my colleague Britta in this presentation is to present you this book and because you take the trouble of listening to it, when you leave the room, there's a copy for you. So that's to keep you in the room, eh? that's the, the <laughs> teaser. Okay, the book itself has four major sections. One is telling you a little bit more about the SDGs and geospatial data. We have things about map design considerations, um, about the um, typical maps and diagrams available, and also of the map use environments. And I would like to um, show a few of these for each of, from each of these sections. So basically, what you see with number one here is, is from the SDG database, the UN database, because again, we have used all the open data sources available at the UN to create all these maps in the book. And also, we of course looked at these indicators, we have analyzed them to look at the character of the data, because that somehow defines on how you can map it, and then you make a map like the one you see here. But then the story doesn't end, because I think what is important is that we as map users, we should be aware of what we are looking at. So I would like to give you this little example. This is about the, uh, one of the indicators mapping the percentage of forest. And it's done at the level of the UN regions. And look at the, this location, Middle Africa. It's dark green, it fits in the one but highest class. And then you start to think, okay, well, there must be lots of trees there, because that's what the map tells us. But then, of course, you should realize on what scale level you look at the map and what kind of patterns you see. So, for instance, if you dive in, the story changes. And that's why, why we highlight the chart in this particular case, because only 3% of the country is covered by what they call forest. So, it's the desert, it's the Sahara. It's, we have a completely different image of that than lots of trees, so to say. Now, I, I don't want to say that all maps lie. In a way, they do, eh? because they are kind of representation of reality, and we have made all kinds of choices and design decisions. Uh, but again, uh, yeah, be aware. I think that, that's the message. And that's also all conveyed in the book. So all these, call them traps, they are discussed. 
Yeah, we made a duo show. I thought it's... <laughs> Yeah, so I started working with Menoyan in 2018, before, right as this project was getting started, and it has been a really exciting journey. So when he first told me about this project, I said, I can map anything. I love open data, I use open data in my teaching, let's do it. But um, I quickly learned every cartographer has a plan till they actually look inside their data set. And this quote is actually a modification of Mike Tyson, every boxer has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. Um, and so sometimes when you look at these data sets um, and you start to map them, it's, you run into problems. Um, so the first, one of the first entries I wrote and did for this book project was the one you see here. So first, uh, define the project goals. What are you trying to communicate with your map? Um, review the available data set and then make decisions based on what's possible with that data. Then you have to clean and format the data sets. So I pose this question a little bit because I've looked through so many different indicators and they're all extremely different because they're curated by different agencies. And then you need to clean them in a way that you can then map them. So that, this, this number three takes a long time. <laughs> this is probably the most time consuming part. Then you need to transform, analyze your data, execute the map design, evaluate, edit the map design, um, and sometimes you need to go back. You need to go back in these steps, and that's, that's normal. So this is an example. This is a map that uh, Menayan actually made um, to show uh, a graphic representation of, um, I think, what is this, water access? Yeah, so this is really cool. Um, so this it, it shows what type of data uh, are available for each indicator, I'm sorry, each goal. So here the bar uh, represents tier one, tier two, tier three, or I'm sorry, tier pending, which means how much data is complete for the whole world. So dark blue means they're the most complete data sets. Um, tier two means, I can't remember the exact uh, cutoff, do you know? It's, it's basically we have methodology but not necessarily data, okay. data but not necessarily Exactly. Okay, so yes, yeah, tier two, there's a methodology, but not necessarily data. So that's the thing, when you start looking at these data sets, you see the title and you think, oh, I can make a great map, but then you open the data and it's largely uh, not available. And then the, the graphic below shows the type, type of data. So is it absolute values? Is it a proportion? Is it a rate? Is it an index? And this was really helpful when we were trying to design our graphics to say, okay, we can make this type of map with this type of data. So this was really useful for us. Now I want to point out that this is changing all the time. These data sets are growing all the time. So this book is going to be a helpful resource for a long time. <laughs> um, but yeah, this is really exciting. Um, then we have maps and diagrams. So sometimes it's not, uh, some diagrams might be more appropriate than a map. As a cartographer, I think we should always make maps, but no, diagrams can be really, really important too. So um, here we've made this kind of, this diagram to help with your decision-making process. Is, is it qualitative data or is it quantitative data? And this is a, a decision support graphic to help you decide what type of thematic map will be most appropriate given this, this specific data set. Um, now, with the UN indicator data sets, the data are aggregated at the country level. So, generally, um, it's the, one of the most appropriate types of maps is choropleth map because it's at the, uh, the administrative unit as country. But the problem is that kind of sometimes gives you a false notion that the phenomenon is distributed evenly across a country when the, when the person looks at your map. So we started to explore the use of disymmetric mapping. And so um, with choropleth maps, you should always use normalized data. But then we started looking at, okay, if we account for where people actually live in that region, so we have this land cover map, um, and then we created an included areas and excluded areas and then um, renormalized the data based on where people actually live, how big is that area. And then the, the spatial trend starts to shift a little bit. So if we start with this traditional choropleth and then we renormalize based on the new value for land area, then the distribution looks a little bit different. And this region is significant because this is where Boko Haram is very uh, active and that's why we picked, picked this region. Um, so when we start to use the indicator data, we start to see stories emerge and start to learn new things about the regions at hand. And this is my, uh, the map I spent the most time on making for this book. <laughs> so I'll pass the floor back to you, Menayan. Thank you.
The question, of course, is if, if we know how to make all these maps, where do you make them and where are you using them? Because that also matters. I mean, if you have a big screen like this, so to say, or you look at it on your mobile phone, or you can print it in a book, that makes a difference, both in, in how you design your map, but also in, in how you can use your map. And, and for instance, um, yeah, dashboards are, are an example where you combine multiple um, yeah, visualizations of your data. Prefer it, it's, it's mainly the same data, but different perspectives. And that allows you to get a better insight in these data. And for instance, in, in a dashboard, that's a good habit. And of course, if you make these maps, and that, that's the diagram on, on the right there, um, that's about your user. Because not only the environment you should consider, but also for whom are you making the maps? I mean, earlier you saw the map discussed with the water, and I, we used water bottles because it was a map for children. Just to think that the symbol, if it's just a bar graph, it's probably not as attractive for children than a bottle which is half empty or half filled. So again, quite important on, on, uh, yeah, to think of your user and also involve this user in a very early stage. Well, this is a kind of summary of the book. We, we had great fun, not, not only because it, it's nice to make a book, but it's even more nice for a cartographer to make maps. I mean, uh, I might be a professor and may mostly talk about things, but making them is far more fun, actually. So, so yeah, I, I can talk hours about this process, so to say. And as you notice from Britta's enthusiasm about the maps we create, I think that, that has been the, the beautiful part. Um, what's next? The book is here. I should also tell you that the book doesn't cover the whole realm of cartography because we worked mainly on, let's say, indicator data which are collected by, in our case, country level. So it's mainly statistics related to countries, nothing about the natural world, nothing about climate itself. I mean, yeah, there are indicators about climate, but not about temperature, rainfall, topography, and so on. So. In our mind, we, we extend the book also with these topics to cover the whole of cartography. And then we're also, um, since it's open data, we all work at educational institutes, so we also think about open education. So all the resources are made available. I mean, the statistical data is already on the UN website. Um, the UN geoinformation um, section will make available the boundary files, and they will be open and then um, the maps which we have created they will be on the github repository so people can access them the, the how they have been created is being described and um, that allows you to yeah to use the data in your own teaching for instance and we're also working on a environment where we put the book into the context of concept maps so that people who want to study it can, can create what we call learning path and see the relation between concepts and also the SDGs. So I think with this, I end my short presentation. So again, there is a copy for you just around the corner of that door if you leave the room. Thank you. Thank you so much. I just love maps. It's a shame that we can't draw them anymore. It's all digital inside your computer. <laughs> Thanks a lot. We are running a little bit behind schedule, which is supposed to be my fault as a moderator. But we do have time for a question. And should we have a virtual question? We do not. So you have the chance now here, uh, face to face with the, uh, with the experts. Hmm? Yes, please. Do you have a... Yeah. Could you take another? Please. Hello, my name is Caroline Robinson from the British Cartographic Society. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, I'm really interested in your book. Um, and I wondered what the challenges were in uh, um, reproducing the maps at such a small size on, the, on a small page. Yeah, now we had the size of the book in our mind. Um, if you look at the, at the small maps, and sometimes you have world maps, well, like this, eh? they're very small, you don't see them. But, but they are based on a boundary file which has too much data. And uh, that's because, well, in the UN, they had some constraints, because that, that was also part of the, of the project to, to work with the UN. Um, I don't mention the word boundaries. Um, but, but, but it, so again, we had to use certain 
files for this. We agreed upon it, so we, we are part of the crime, so to say, partisan crime. Um, yeah. There's an entry about it. Huh? There is an entry about it uh, with the, the gutters and the frames. Yeah, yeah. So, so the way how we did it, because we, we st you're all aware of atlases, and if you design an atlas, there's a kind of frame on how you design your, your web, your pages, and that's also what we used for the book, so that everything would fit. And then again, we, of course, um, yeah, applied our um, style sheet. It's also a chapter on legend where we, and, and that tells you all about line width and everything so that it looks good in the book, at least to our opinion, but, but you to judge that, of course. Thanks again, thank you so much. And uh, we are now come to the uh, part of the session where we have a panel. And we have four speakers from the broad spectrum of the SDGs. And what will happen now is that each speaker will give a short introductory remark and then we will place them all on chairs here and then your chance is to interact with these experts. So please do also, you attending virtually. But uh, our first speaker is uh, Mr. Tim Trainer. Tim Trainer is president for the International Cartographic Association, also member of the US National, Ge National Geospatial Advisory no. Committee and former co-chair of the UNGGIM. I did it. So please, Mr. Trainer, the floor is yours. Well, thanks. Um, so uh, you've just heard about this great book that was produced by the ICA and by the United Nations. Um, and I would say that this was more than a book project, uh, obviously. Um, uh, you know, the ICA initiated efforts at exploring how cartography could support the SDGs. Um, from collecting data, for example, for countries having to do that, to seeing the summary results um, and the potential impacts of the data, um, to initiate efforts for integrating data across different SDGs, which is an activity that really hasn't uh, been explored much. Uh, the, the SDGs have been handled on a case-by-case -case basis, but if you think about the indicators going across different SDGs, uh, there's a lot of opportunity there. And so the other point is that it helps them in strategizing about next steps, what, what to do next with the SDGs. Just as Menno Jan indicated, we're thinking about what to do next with the, the book itself. So this project was a collaboration. So now we're talking a little bit about partnership. And it was a collaboration between what I would consider to be a very structured organization with lots of rules and guidelines, where another way to say it would be that's the United Nations. Uh, and it was coupled with a very loosely coordinated organization, and I would say that's the ICA, where we're not, we're not a very structured organization. Um, the players from both sides worked together to achieve success in the project, but not without some challenges. And those points they worked through, as you, as you heard uh, reference, references to, to, to a couple of those points. To address the SDGs in the circular economy, information is needed to determine what is possible and then to identify the challenges that are anticipated uh, so that strategies for mitigation can be considered. You know, the circular, circular economy holds a particular promise for several of the SDGs. For example, the SDG 6 on energy, uh, 8 on economic growth, 11 on sustainable cities, 12 on sustainable consumption and production, 13 on climate change, 14 on oceans, and 15 on land life on land. The word common to the circular economy, economy in my view, in, in this particular example, is reuse. Use and reuse. Um, so this is a project that proves in successfully integrating statistical and geospatial data. Uh, the book and its supporting raw data and process data files uh, were challenged by things like uh, coverage, inconsistent coverage, uh, varying quality, different definitions, uh, variable uh, temporal timestamps. But a cartographer knows about these kinds of things, and they must sort through the issues and make decisions based on various consultations. So it, it's, it's, it's a choice, it's, it's a decision that has to be made as you go through that process. The increasing number and diversity of data types often have location as one of their characteristics that place the data uh, with related geospatial information. 
So in order to do that, you need to look at things like criteria, uh, methods, procedures, and processes uh, so that you can apply those and manage the data while users have an invested interest in seeing that it's done correctly. Because when they look at a map, they always assume that the map is correct. No one goes in and looks at a map and thinks it's wrong. They always assume that it's correct. So my last point is that to address the SDGs in the circular economy, cartography can show the as is, it can show what might be, uh, and what actually occurs. And I think the, uh, an evidence of that reuse is that the United Nations will be publishing um, 17 SDG maps, so one map per SDG, as a spin-off from the book at our upcoming International Cartographic Conference in Florence in December, in a couple of months' time. So we invite you to come and see those maps. Thank you. Thank you a lot. And we will move fast forward to uh, Mr. Javier Caranza, Executive Director for Geosensus Foundation. So please, Mr. Caranza, the floor is yours. Hello, everybody. Good morning. I am from Geosensus Foundation. We are an NGO. We are participative in the data ecosystem. We are really happy to be here, and we really appreciate the invitation from Geospatial Media and all the collaboration from, from the group, from Team Trainum mostly, from Rolando, from Sandra, and from Mula to make this, uh, I think, would be a great session of what I think it would be a great session. My, my idea here is to present you the integration of the statistics in, and geospatial uh, data within the context of what was presented. Uh, of course, we are going to speak about mapping for a sustainable world. Mapping for a sustainable world is mostly, uh, you know, getting together and getting the maps done. But not only those colored, beautiful ones that the book, Mapping for Sustainability, has, but also to map it together as groups, you know. So as an NGO, we propose to work with other partners and to raise from the bottom up you know, information. So basically what we would like to do is to analyze together the book and maybe to find some kind of, you know, leverage from the, the room and also from the audience in the online version and we could map together, let's say, uh, a, let's say a better session or, or a session. And also I would be introducing what was Mr. Mr. Scott speaking about regarding the GSGF the general framework regarding the integration of statistics and also spatial data. Because uh, I've been working also as a consultant on a book coming from the International Organization Realm regarding the integration, of course, of data in the spatial side and also data and statistics, which are not exactly the same, we all know. And as Brita said, it's not really easy to get them together. So let's get this started. And what I would like to share with you is what do you think about running together this kind of exercises? What would be the strengths that we have from the book of Mapping for a Sustainable World? For a sustainable world. That, that's the title, right? I already read it. I, I have a version here. Tim, this is for the audience. On, uh, I already read it and make my comments here. So I wanted to share it with you and maybe we could find together this. I think that mostly the strengths are based on, of course, the, the great structure it has regarding the definitions. It, 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 it clearly states without any kind of, you know, cha-cha-cha behind and whatever. It goes just to the point, just define whatever you want to do and you find a good indicator to do that. And that's really good for us because we all learn what is about, you know, mapping sustainability, sustainable, uh, the, uh, you know, SDGs. Uh, so that's a great point. And also it mentions the open world. It, it has a brief mention, I would say, to the open data world and also the open source world. I really appreciate that and really thank you. Because uh, what we do from Census is to find the leverage of open data to take it broad map to higher stands, you know, like the census, for instance, that we could cover together with national statistical offices, for instance, we could do so. 
uh, and if we have the right standard, right? And we respect the privacy and the, the, seg the segregation uh, criteria. But regarding the opportunities I see for the book, I'm sorry if I'm not heard, but I see that this could be a great tool to outreach other communities, not only, you know, governments, which would be the main target, because we know the role of UN, you know, targeting uh, member countries, but also for those other national associations, not only professional ones, but also NGOs maybe, and also academia maybe. Well, you are from the 20 University, where, well, myself, I studied there, so we know that. And we are part of civil society together, you no? Know? Uh, we need more of this, so I appreciate the effort. Regarding the weaknesses, what I would say, uh, I don't want to bring it to tense, <laughs> but what I would say is that maybe the, the open side could be developed further. And you could add also some open source kind of stuff, you know, to update this. Also, what I would suggest is that probably uh, we could structure future versions or other versions or follow-up versions regarding the need of specific geospatial indicators organized as in GEOS. GEOS has worked on this already and has, you know, de designed which are the, those indicators. But that's not really a weakness, it's just another point of view, okay? And regarding the threats, of course, whenever we are writing the same as when you take a car out of, of the dealer, uh, it, it, it loses, you know, value. So the, the real threat is, you know, it, it loses, uh, you know, validity and credibility over time because, you know, the technology evolves a lot and there are so many data going on and so on. So those would be my point. But uh, the floor is open to you if you'd like to raise anything of this. Uh, could we do that? Not just now. Not just now. Okay. Let's go to the next slide. And Let's check which is the, which, how many of you? That's one. One, okay. How we we'll go for this and invite you to also check another book I've been co-authoring together with OCD and that has its objectives and it's about implementing a sequential manner, the GSGF. These are GSGF that have been done also by member countries through, of course, you know, the Secretariat of UNGGIM, and basically what we explain our principles, the processes, and step-by-step -step explanations about how to integrate statistics to gather spatial data, which is basically the point of this whole meeting, right? So that's what I wanted to share with you, that there are other resources, and of course, I don't think it's a threat for this book, you know. I think it's complementing, basically. It's the how to more to what to say, right? So what we wanted to say is that these are the steps we are proposing, and this is the book, of course, and basically the steps goes from choosing the right people for the right roles, you know, regarding integration of data and making available sources and going through the process of people and data technology, the ambience of the data, the common geographies, the visualization, and finally, the interoperability, which has been an idea that has not been already shown. So, Ula, the floor is yours again, and please allow me then to go back to what I was proposing, okay? Absolutely, and thank ah. you so much. Yeah, well, and this is what it's all about, right? Yeah. Different opinions, different angles, different views. Yeah. Otherwise, we won't learn anything. And please welcome our next speaker, uh, Mr. Rolando Cambo, Director of the Statistic Division, Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean. Thank you very much for, uh, for the presentation. What I'm going to, to, to do is, I'm going to give three examples about uh, all the things that we have seen in this, uh, the standards, the GSGF, the integration of, of the information with the integrated geospatial uh, information uh, uh, framework, uh, all the, the process that we saw through the, the books and the use of, of the geospatial information, the maps, and the open data. And my three, my three uh, points is uh, I'm going to present three examples. The one is a development account that we are facing with, uh, with in, in UN. Another one that we have the, with the European, with the funding, with the European uh, facility, 
and um, our new Cepal Stat platform that we launched uh, uh, f last Friday uh, that includes a geospatial uh, and geostatistical uh, component and geospatial and statistics component. So the, the, our DA13 is a, uh, what we want to do is to innovate approaches to examine uh, inequality through the integration of different data sources in Latin America and the Caribbean. And so we have these five countries uh, who are participating with, in this uh, project. And, uh, and the main objective is to support the COVID-19 recovery and the implementation of the 2030 agenda through the innovative approaches for measuring inequality and, and, and identification of other uh, vulnerable population groups. So, and the specific project is to increase capacities to integrate different sources, national accounts, tax information, and household surveys, uh, to increase capacities to integrate your special and statistical data and information, and to strengthen capacities to produce disaggregated statistics using small area estimation uh, techniques that that could give a very nice solution to the process, to the, uh, the different uh, specs that uh, the maps in the, uh, in the country can, can give us. Uh, so uh, the project is uh, six steps to the adoption of the coding, uh, methodologies, strengthening capacities, implementation of policies, standards, and good practices and technology, national agreements between the national statistical offices and the uh, geospatial and geographical agencies to establish a national geostatistical framework a roadmap to integrate the statistical and geospatial information and to include uh, some COVID-19 uh, variables, pilot geospatial for the geospatial platform. Uh, these are the procedures that we are, and we are now in the, the current stage, uh, the needs assessment, a technical assistant, national workshops, and a regional workshop at the end of 24. The second one is uh, uh, the, the project that we have with the uh, European Union is to strengthen the special capacities of national statistical offices to monitor the 2030 agenda in Latin America and the Caribbean. We have seven countries that are participating here, and the main objectives are the development of a technological platform for the, for the management and visualization of statistical and geospatial data, ensuring its integration and complementing and complemented it with your reference information. And the specifics objectives is to improve access to your statistical data produced by national statistical offices to facilitate the integration of uh, in the, with statistical offices data with public and non-governmental sector geospatial information and to support decision making and elaboration of public policies. These are uh, the custom uh, statistical geoportal. We want it to be uh, consistent with the initial, uh, our initial diagnosis, adapted to the requirements of the National Statistical Office, uh, to be interoperable with existing uh, architectures, to support for internal statistical and data management process, and to be interoperable with other solutions and flexible to support additional needs. So this is the process that we are working now. So we have a first step, and the project has three years, uh, the diagnosis, design, development, implementation, and monitoring. And this is uh, my third example, is uh, uh, the CEPAL studies, the new CEPAL STAT interface and its geospatial component. So uh, the new, we have a better browsing experience and easier access. We have new content and functionality. So we have all the statistics information that we have in ECLAC for all the Latin American and, and, and Caribbean countries. And we wanted to integrate all the, uh, uh, to integrate it of statistical and special information in a new geoportal. And of course, align with the principles of the United Nations data strategy that has to with open source, open data, to be interoperable, integrated, comparable, that has trustability, and to be seen in the territory. So as I mentioned, the, the, all the examples, so uh, this geoportal is consistent with the uh, global guidelines of the global statistical and geospatial framework and the integrating, uh, the, 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 the integrating geospatial information framework generated uh, the first one by the Statistical Commission and UNGIM and the second one uh, with the UNGIM. And, and so 
the, our job portal uh, has is an open geospatial consortium of standards, uh, ISO metadata, uh, geospatial uh, technology. Uh, we have web mapping library, uh, backend framework, GeoNode, geospatial databases, metadata desktops, and GIS. So some figures, more than 102,000 indicators, more than 6 million of unique records, 300 external geographical layers, 460, well, all this, this information. And what I want to show, this is our portal. And so uh, here you can find all the information. So these are the, the, the figures, but uh, what I want to show you is that uh, social poverty, population living in extreme poverty. So you can see there uh, all the, select all, national, aligned, and then you can go to the, to the web and you can see that in a geo portal where you can add uh, all the information um, from different layers. Well, the internet is not so good, so but. So we can try this at home. Exactly, <laughs> so you can do it at home so you can see all the, the, the information in the, in the map. Well, thank you for, for your patience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I will definitely try this at home. Um, last but definitely not least, uh, please welcome uh, Sandra Mayorga, Technical Director of uh, Geostatistics, National Administrative Department of Statistics, DANE in Colombia. Hi, everybody. It's a pleasure to me to be here um, in, with this interesting panel and with this interesting presentation. Um, in this opportunity, I would like to share with you the Colombian experience in the, um, in the process of integrated statistical and geospatial information, as, uh, particularly for SDGs. So, um, in Colombia, we have a big challenge with the accomplishment of the, uh, of the 20. 30 agenda. We have different gaps in some indicators uh, because for some indicators we don't have enough information uh, to calculate. So for the reason we started a project to explore the use of different new administrative data, geospatial data, and new sources of information to reduce these gaps. So we started to use free satellite image, we started to use uh, different tools and techniques that help a lot to reduce these gaps. And this is the examples that I want to show with you today. So first of all, we get to calculate the indicator, the SGD indicator for three indicators that are finished. We calculate, um, for example, the SDG 9.1.1, that is the proportion of the rural population who live within two kilometers of an old season road. Um, to do that, we integrate different sources of information. We take into account the georeference data from the, um, the population census, but also we integrate information from the National Mapping Agency, from the roads, and we take into account the topography. We use different digital elevation models to calculate this distance. So um, finally, we can finish the indicator and we have this indicator um, calculate for different periods of years. Also, we calculate the indicator 11.3.1, that is the ratio of land consumption rate to population growth rate. To do that, we, we use mainly two sources of information. We use um, Sentinel-2 and Landsat image, and also we use population projections uh, based on the last um, national population census in Colombia. And thanks to do that, we calculate uh, this, uh, um, this SDG indicator from different cities in Colombia. 
Recently, we finished the calculation also of the SDG indicator 11.7.1, that is the average share of build-up areas of citizens that is open space for public use for all. It means disaggregate by sex, age, and persons with disability. So, in this case, we use, again, uh, satellite image Sentinel. Um, also, we take into account information from the georeferenced geo census to understand where are the people with disabilities, disaggregate, disaggregate by sex, by age, and we use also a different database, registered administrative data, to identify the open public um, space. And also we have, um, we use open access sources like, like an open street map to um, adjust this uh, database. So um, thanks to do that, we finished the calculation of this indicator. Um, for in, at the beginning, we don't have information for, for this indicator, but thanks to the use of these techniques and this information, we can obtain information of this um, indicator and I'd say at the beginning, reduce the gaps. Also, we are in progress to calculate other indicators because we identified that there are a big potential to use the geospatial information, techniques, tools, and different elements to uh, produce new information that is needed. So in this context, we are um, working in the SDG 11.1.1, that is the proportion of urban population that live in, in slums informal settlements or inadequate housing. So um, we are calculated this indicator for 68 cities and we are mainly use the um, population census um, take into account the georeferenced information. And also, we are calculating the indicator 11.2.1, that is the proportion of population that has convenient access to public transport disaggregated by sex, age, and persons with disabilities. So um, definitely there are a big opportunities to um, use this information, reduce the gaps, and get information necessary. Finally, we um, have put all this information in a geoport Portal, um, that allow to geo-visualize the different indicators that we have, uh, collect back this data, but also collect back different other sources like survey, uh, census, calculate by other institutions. So we have this uh, portal that allow to the people access to the information, um, see the information to different disaggregated labels, and have access in general to the information. So. Um, definitely, there are a lot of lessons learned. Um, uh, at, at the end, they use special information, but also they use special tools, methods, has a great potential to um, integrate and, and increase the information that we have and give information disaggregate for all. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, Sandra. And uh, now I will invite the panel up here you can either grab a chair or you can stand, because we don't have uh, much time. Uh, time is a merciless uh, master. But I will give you the chance now to pose a question. Meanwhile, you think about that. We do have a question uh, from the virtual audience, which is very good that you are engaging as well. And it is actually for Rolando. Um, the question is, is one year realistic, a realistic deadline for your project? Is one year a realistic deadline for your project? If you don't mind, you can use mine. Uh, well, I, I don't know which, uh, what project, uh, but the two ones that I present, uh, there are three years uh, um, time. So the first year, year was for uh, just uh, have um, um, the, uh, to know the, uh, the, the what how how the country is uh, is in that uh, regard. The second year is for, for to work with them with the platform and all those issues. And the third year is for the implementation. 
and and the other one for the uh, the Cepalestat is is now working. Just shift. Thanks a lot. And uh, we have a question here. We do like this. <laughs> Hi, I'm Amy Kokenauer from Cadasta Foundation. I'd like to hear from each of you. What is your high level one clear message that you would like to share that, that you feel is important to share out to uh, both national stakeholders and global stakeholders around the work that you're doing? What is your sort of number one message that you'd like to share um, in, in terms of the importance of the work that you're doing? So um, from my perspective, uh, this project is, or th this topic is about integrating statistical and geospatial information. And so in that case, neither, neither one of those data types stand on their own for the purposes of trying to, for example, deal with the, the challenges of the SDGs, uh, one of which is climate change and, and, and other obviously important topics. So I think the, the importance is that we need to use the tools that we're hearing about, we need to share that information, and we need to do it in such a way that more can be done in bringing those two different data types together so that use of the results can really benefit society as a whole. Yeah, difficult to say. So many messages to give out. Uh, I understand that the, the mapping for a sustainable world is a really great effort because basically it integrates. And I guess the message behind it that we can really integrate. Sandra was showing that you use, you know, open street map data. And those are data coming from civil society, basically grassroots and people on the ground that are working right now and that are collecting data. And also, you know, Rolando was showing the Sepastat project, which is also integration of many, many, many sources. So I guess the integration is possible and that we can integrate. I guess that would be the great message behind this, that we need to integrate, we can integrate, and we will integrate. Cool. Please pass it on to well, I think that the integration of geospatial and statistical information uh, has a great potential, and but disseminate results, but to create new information to help to understand what happened and why it happened. And definitely we need to continue working on that, continue to improve the capacity, capacity building to uh, use and um, create new information and analysis. Thank you. I think the, for me, the main message, message uh, in the region, in Latin America and the Caribbean, is that, uh, that we have to integrate the geospatial agencies that most of them are uh, militars uh, from the defense areas and the statistical offices. And so the integration in between them, that can give uh, a better position for decision making for the, uh, uh, the governments. So that is uh, uh, an issue. And if you see, if you have that, for example, if you have disasters, uh, uh, phenomenal, uh, uh, meteorolo meteorological phenomenon, uh, so you can use this information in a better way, in a better way. So this is. Thanks a lot. And thanks for a very good question. We have like two and a half minutes left. So you still have a chance to pose a question to, hmm? And if, yeah, <laughs> then, then, then I will have the pleasure now and, and asking you briefly, uh, all of you to answer, where are we regarding students? Do we have enough skilled young people to take up our work when we don't do it anymore? And I will start. Oh, you're so keen, Javier. We will start with Sandra. <laughs> well, yes, this is a, a good challenger. Uh, for example, in our institution, we um, work with universities to improve the capacity buildings in the um, in the people that work with us, but also to identify the new um, challengers that the academia need to take into account. So um, 
for us it's very important to work with the different um, educational institutions to share our experience um, for us and that for they understand what we need but definitely the technology changed a lot and we need to uh, improve the capacity to everybody and and not also in the national way but also to share the experience in the international um, aspects to understand what other countries is doing, what are their uh, successes case happen and how we can uh, use these uh, examples for, for us. So yes, there are a lot of challenges, but there are a, a, a lot of do, to do, to, uh, things to do. Thank you. That's good. I think um, um, so from the academy, so what we want to do from ECLAC is uh, begin to go to, with the universities to show the work that we are doing and with the, uh, from the statistical side and the geospatial side to see there is an opportunity to identify and to work with them. So we have some students and we have young people, uh, the first portal that we uh, made in ECLAC comes from a lady um, that uh, she, she was leaving the school and so she supports us uh, a lot, um, the, the geoportal for the COVID-19 observatory. So she made that with their own uh, medias and, and all those issues. So it is an opportunity to incorporate and of course the young people has more opportunities to improve in this kind of, of, of science. Um, I, I would say um, in my observation in working with different countries, different developing countries, there's a total disconnect between the academic uh, offerings and what's needed on the job. And so I think that in order to um, address that, the academic community needs to have a conversation with, with those who are trying to do all of this great work. The book is a start. The book is an example of how a book like that can be used in a classroom setting. But it's just a tiny, tiny piece of the bigger picture. There needs to have a conversation. There needs to be a conversation. Thank you. And did you yeah. finish off this session? Okay, thank you very, very, very much. I never dreamed about this. Uh, my message would be that, yes, we need to involve students. And students are not only those going to university. Students are those that are behind the screen in their homes trying to find out their way through the world. So what we tried in GeoCensus, uh, GeoCensus would be the word really, uh, is that we, we run these hackathons or mapathons so called, for instance one of them called the MAPS Hackathon, which is the Mesoamerica Apps Hackathon, that was oriented to solving local issues and bringing society together and finding different massive collaboration approaches. This has been already done in, in Colombia together with, with uh, MINTIC, the Ministry of Technologies and Information Communication, and we have proposed also to SEA, to the Statistical Conference of Americas, to run this kind of experiences, and we'll keep in, on doing that. So we should map together a better world. Those were the final words. We should map together a better world. Wow. <laughs> Thank you all for attending. Thank you all speakers. Uh, I learned a lot. Hope you did as well. And ciao to the virtual audience as well. Goodbye.